Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Susan Collins. I'm the dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And thank you. And on behalf of the Ford School and the entire University of Michigan, it is such an honor to welcome all of you here today. Um, I'd in particular like to recognize President Mark Schlissel, Provost Martha Pollack, Regent Michael Beam, Regent Emerita Julia Darlow, and several of the university's executive offices and deans who are here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'd like to acknowledge, as well, my faculty colleagues who are part of the steering committee for today's events. The university's vice provost for equity and inclusion and the chief diversity officer, Rob Sellers, professors Martha Jones, Ann Lynn, and Matthew Countryman, and also my fellow dean of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance, Aaron Dworkin. Thank you all so much. Indeed, it really is a great honor to welcome all of you here today to hear from one of the nation's most distinguished champions of civil rights, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Before, profession, before President Schlissel introduces him more fully, I'd like to offer my thanks to Reverend Jackson for spending the entire day here with us, with our students and our faculty. Thank you so much for that. We really appreciate all of your time. We're also so pleased to have his wife, Jacqueline Jackson, his son, his daughter, and his grandson all here with us this afternoon. Reverend Jackson, I look forward to your remarks, and I know that I speak for many in this room and many who are watching the live stream that the remarks that you will give us today are so needed and are extremely important, and so we are very much looking forward to them. And now it is my honor to introduce Dr. Mark Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan. Pre President Schlissel most recently served as provost of Brown University. He's the first physician to lead our university. His academic research has contributed to a detailed understanding of the genetic factors involved in producing antibodies and how mistakes in that process can lead to leukemia and lymphoma. President Schlissel earned his AB in biochemical sciences from Princeton and went on to Johns Hopkins University in medicine, earning both an MD and a PhD. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the University of Michigan's 14th president, Mark Schlissel. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much, Dean Collins, for that very kind introduction and for your outstanding leadership over the past decade of the Ford School of Public Policy. I'd like to thank the symposium organizing committee as well, uh, and also acknowledge uh, the role of my friend Bankale Thompson in helping us organize today's session. Uh, everyone at the Ford School as well who's helped our community in their efforts over the past week or the whole election season uh, understand the impact of this year's election. Today, we recognize a distinguished national leader and we honor a legacy that spans more than half a century. The Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr has led the way in the struggle for freedom, voting rights, equality, and peace here in the cities and towns of the United States and abroad. We should all take note that his first experience as a social activist was as a student. In the summer of 1960 in his hometown of Greenville, South Carolina, Reverend Jackson refused to be turned away from the segregated local public library. He's been at the forefront of the struggle for civil rights ever since. During the mid-1960s, he worked with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and helped secure the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. He ran for president in 1984 and 1988, building unprecedented coalitions of voters 
and inspiring millions. And as recently as last week, Reverend Jackson was traveling throughout our nation, working to get out the vote, meeting people in our communities, and battling new challenges to the Voting Rights Act that he had helped to enact. For his numerous accomplishments, Reverend Jackson was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2000. It's our nation's highest civilian honor. The University of Michigan community is also very proud to count Reverend Jackson as an alumnus. He was awarded an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from our university in 1979. But like many of our graduates, he didn't receive his degree and leave Ann Arbor forever. Reverend Jackson came back to campus. He came back in 1987 to meet with activists in the BAM3 movement and the University Coalition Against Racism. He also came back to campus in 2000 and spoke in our law quad in support of students who had organized to defend affirmative action. These were momentous times in our university's history events whose impact reverberates to this very day. They were part of our nearly 200 year history and they informed the strategic plan we rolled out last month to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion at the University of Michigan. And now, he's back today. We all know there's much more work to do. During the run up to the election and the days since, we've seen attacks that single out individuals and groups based on their identities. We can't forget how this makes our students feel. But we've also seen demonstrations espousing peace, inclusion, and tolerance. We've heard from many in our community about the need to make room for voices all across the ideological spectrum and for all to speak out against hate and discrimination. This afternoon, in fact, students again gathered on our diag to make their voices heard. Before I invite our guest of honor to the stage, I want to share a few words from his University of Michigan commencement address in 1979. He said, we no longer have the luxury, nor can we afford racial polarization on various aberrations and expressions of petty apartheid. A multiracial education must be our personal, local, and national goal for we must develop the capacity to live with each other and not apart from each other. The title of Reverend Jackson's address today is What's Next for Us? Hope and Reflection. Please help me welcome civil rights leader, former student activist, founder and president of the Rainbow Push Coalition, and inspiration to all who strive for peace and social justice, the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Today I want to thank President Mark Schussel for, and Dean Susan M. Collins of the Gerald Ford Public Policy Center, the faculty and students and beneficiaries of the University of Michigan around the world. The good of the university has made its commitment to the America that it is and accepted the call, the mission and responsibility to aid in building the nation that we must become. We are a nation that has come from the pit of 246 years of slavery, which began 157 years before the birth of the nation in 1776, the genocide of Native Americans, legal segregation of Jim Crow in 1880 to 1954, over 5,000 lynchings without one indictment. The foundation of our nation is this immoral sin for which we have not sought forgiveness nor redemption. Any idea of making America great again reopens the wounds in America's immoral foundation 
born in sin and shaped in iniquity. The school has consistently sought to step in the breach and to bring healing to the body politic. We need not for a moment underestimate the damage done to our country and the cleavage in the soul of America in the last few days. It's our nation and our soul that must be healed. What are we confronted with? There is a tug of war for the soul of America. Dr. King and SCLC's mission was to redeem the soul of America and that the base of our nation is an identity crisis. Do we want to be an aristocracy or a democracy? Multiculturalism or race supremacy? An aristocracy of the few or a democracy for the many? Will we be a one person, one vote democracy or ruled by electoral overseers? President Abraham Lincoln said our nation could not survive half slave and half free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. There's been a lot of analysis as to why Secretary Hillary Clinton lost her presidency a few days ago. Much of it valid, but from my perspective, the pundits have missed the central reason. New undemocratic voter laws and voter suppression. Ari Berman, in his brilliant book, Give Us the Ballot, points out that between 2011 and 15, 395 new laws of voter restriction introduced in state legislatures in 49 states. Many of them became law voter restriction. If the voting rights had been fully and fairly protected, we would be bringing a different discussion today. She won the popular vote. If it were not for voter suppression, she would have won the vote in the Electoral College as well. New voting laws since June 25, 2013 have wiped out 868 polling places. That includes removing polling places from campuses and other familiar places. There's nothing more fundamental in this whole discussion than voter denial access. A nation speaks of meritocracy, but hard work, effort, and excellence cannot match or compete with inheritance access and racial favor. Our struggles have made us freer across the years, but, but not equal. We need to make some moral and legal choices. Shall we be a nation with people who do the crime, including those running multinational corporations who work on Wall Street do the time? Will we become the double standard of only punishing people of color and the poor? Do we have the nerve to free and pardon those who did their time for the crime and offer them a clean slate and a new start? President Lincoln pardoned Jefferson Davis and other Confederates who engaged in treason against the United States of America in an effort to bind up and heal the wounds after the Civil War. President Ford did the same thing with respect to Richard Nixon after Watergate, even though he had violated dishonored and debased the Constitution. Well, it was clear that he would have been impeached and convicted and driven from office legally and technically. He was never indicted, tried, not convicted of anything. Unique to Ford and Nixon was that Nixon was never officially accused, tried or even sought a pardon. President Ford was simply determined to stop the potential harm, restrain the hemorrhaging, and heal the wound. There are those in their anger and spirit of retribution want to use Hillary Clinton as a trophy in the name of false justice. It would be wise in the name of justice and the lineage of Lincoln and Ford for President Obama to do the same and to pardon Hillary Clinton. <laughs> President-elect Trump, while the presidential candidate, promised to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate Secretary Clinton and try to put her in prison. Even though Secretary Clinton has not been legally accused, indicted, tried, or convicted of anything, President Obama should follow President Ford's example and offer a preemptive full pardon and inoculation against politically motivated prosecution in the spirit of healing the divisions in our country. To do otherwise will only exacerbate and divisions and hardened feelings on both sides. It would be a monumental, moral, and political mistake to pursue the prosecution of Hillary Clinton. 
Such a mean-spirited action against her would unleash a nasty spirit in the nation and would damage our government. There's still tremendous tension in our country because of unfinished business, this resulting in the current political turmoil of street protests. The popular vote winner will have more than two million vote lead, but is significantly behind in the Electoral College to retain the 228. Over 13 million votes were cast in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. The three states Hillary Clinton needed to win, but she lost by a cumulative vote of 110,000 in those states. Are we going to have a one person, one vote system or not? President Clinton uh, said the right he said we must go forward by hope and not backwards by fear. Donald Trump said the electoral college was ridiculous and he, until he won, and then he said it was a great system to respect its smaller states. That is what rigging looks like. <laughs> what makes it difficult to turn this decision loose is that the popular vote did not elect Donald Trump. The manner in which he ran his campaign on racism and sexism and xenophobia and religious bigotry has unleashed massive hatred, fear, and division in our country. Protesters driven by fear and pain, fear of mass deportations, fear of a wall that can be irreparable harm to this in our southern neighbor, Mexico. Fear of little children crying, terrified that their parents may be deported. Fear of rejecting an American judge because of his Mexican-American heritage. Fear of banning Muslims. Fear of limiting trade access. Our democracy has been damaged. This school must be a sanctuary for its classmates and its friends. Let Ann Arbor stand up and stand tall as we seek to heal our nation and make a more perfect union. This is not just about Democrats, it's about democracy. It's not about Republicans, it's about the Republic and its character. The role of money permitted by Citizens United is undemocratic and hurts our democracy. Racism, fear, anger, and economic anxiety in rural and small town America play the role. Many rural communities that voted twice for Barack Obama but voted for Trump in 2016 out of economic desperation. Sexism had an impact. The abandonment of the working class and organized labor play the role. We globalize capital without globalizing human rights and workers' rights and women's rights and children's rights and the LGBTQ rights. The Russians hacking the Hillary's and the DNC's emails, exposing them also hurt. The media giving Trump over $2 billion in free advertising just for entertaining, not emancipating. The announcement of Affordable Health Care Act's insurance increases just before the election hurt. The comment letters hurt. The FBI intervention in 2016 and the Supreme Court intervention in 2000 election impact the outcome of each election. In 2000 it was the Supreme Court, 2016 it was the FBI. Most of these points in the top-down analysis by the pundits were made and accepted, but they virtually ignored the suppression of the black vote. The recent New York Times editorial said that a Republican official in North Carolina boasted that cutbacks in early voting reduced black turnout by 8.5%, increased white turnout by 22.5% just by manipulation of the rules and the precincts. The voter suppression affects many groups, Hispanics, Asians, women, workers, young people, seniors, the disabled and whites, but the primary target was African Americans. The right to vote is the most basic right in the democracy, but the black vote is the foundation of the Democratic Party and process. We came in 1619. We're not the bottom, we're the foundation of our country. When the foundation shakes, the whole world trembles. Deny blacks access to the vote and you affect the Democratic Party and the national vote. The effect is felt on the Electoral College. President Barack Obama and others said that we don't have a national voting system, but a state and local voting system. You can rig an American presidential race, but really you can. You don't have to rig the entire system, just rig three or four states and suppress the black vote. Do it in Florida, 
in 2000 win by 537, not counting 27,000 votes in DeVal County, Florida. The state of Florida had the right to stop the count. The black vote denied after 1965 and discounted in 2000 and suppressed in 2016. The common denominator of all of this madness is about the demise of the black vote. In 2016, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, where federal appeals court said the state legislature had passed a racial discriminatory voting law targeted blacks with alarmed surgical precision. So-called liberal states like Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan don't have early voting, which is an institutional form of voter suppression, disenfranchising 5.8 million ex-felons who served their time in prison but are still on probation or parole is voter suppression that affects black, brown, young, and poor people disproportionately. Most voters will be surprised to learn that no American, I say no American, as an American, has the fundamental right to vote. The explicit fundamental individual right to vote is not in the Constitution. Each of us has a state right to vote, but not a citizenship right to vote. Ironically, after the Heller decision, we have an individual right to a gun, but not an individual right to vote in the Constitution. You know that's crazy. <laughs> the only reason that these states can do what they do, for example, Texas passing a, a voting law that allows you to use a gun for ID, but not a student ID is because we have a state's right and local control voting system. We must add a right to vote amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It gives every individual the right to vote and gives Congress the authority to establish a unified national voting system. A voting system would be decentralized and operated by state and local jurisdictions, but they would each have to meet the federal standards. A right to vote amendment would set the constitutional framework for Congress to pass laws to allow early voting everywhere, to modernize and pay to replace old worn out machines, to mandate automatic voter registration at age 18, to allow same day on site voter registration in voting, to allow for non-basic partisan voter education, how to use voter machines in our schools. We must democratize democracy and make America better for all of its people. Ironically, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, whom I just talked a few minutes ago, had joint and legitimate concerns. Workers left behind as a result of technological advances. Workers left behind and got the raw end of globalization. Victims of stagnant wages and lower incomes. They're having trouble or can't pay for their children to go to college. This will be the first generation whose children will have less than their parents had. Both were for change, though in different directions. While the social numerators were different, the economic denominators were the same. Both Trump and Sanders looked on a dry field of economic pain. Banks were bailed out. Homeowners discriminated, decimated, and left out. No plan for reinvestment in the communities most damaged. On that dry field of desperation, Bernie Sanders put water on trees and flowers of opportunity to grow. Donald Trump poured gasoline on the field and lit a match. Big business and financial lobbyists are falling over themselves today trying to get access to the new drain the swamp administration in Washington. Here's how ridiculous things have become. Former Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott, now one of Washington's top lobbyists, told the New York Times, Trump has pledged to change things in Washington about draining the swamp. He's going to need some people to help guide him through the swamp, how to you get in, how do you navigate. We want to help him do that. I bet they are. <laughs> the candidate who ran against Washington's corruption and insider deal making has now turned to a rogues gallery of corporate insiders, lobbyists, Corporate lawyers, staff from corporate back think tanks, and corporate execs themselves to run the transition team. The price we're going to pay for the invasion of Iraq, expensive price for madness and wrongness. A system, a war based on lie, a preemptive strike. Fighting in Afghanistan, being supportive in Syria in approaching $6 trillion. A lot of legitimate anger and fear in the U.S. and around the world raised 
with economic anxiety. This anti-immigrant phenomenon and growing nationalism is sweeping not just the U.S., but Western Europe as well. Be very afraid. The climate has been set. The KKK has been marching and celebrating while nationalists are on the move. I don't mean be afraid personally. That's the fact and will of this climate, but be not afraid personally. Politically, be fearful for your country and the world. He won because of white anger and fear and racial resentment in the content of economically distressed times for money for many who are not used to being in economic distress. But blacks have been distressed for a long time. We don't have to march around with flags in the streets intimidating and threatening people. And have an extreme right-wing Congress and governors' offices around the nation. Wall Street is now setting records now because they expect the handcuffs to be taken off Dodd-Frank, the Consumer Protection Agency, deregulation generally on business. But it's possible that he could destroy the U.S. and the world econ economics and take the entire world over the economic cliff. Our environment could be irreparably damaged with his unleashing of the foolish fossil fuel industry. Sustained massive nonviolent resistance to Trump is needed, hopefully without violence and repression. Dr. King said in his question, where do we go from here? What steps should we take? How do we keep hope and resistance alive? First, we must maintain hope. Students don't let them break your spirit. Not a naive hope because we cannot come out of the deep hole we in with a naive or false hope. Deep water does not drown you. You drown because you stop kicking. Because you surrender, because you give up, because you do less than your best. And no one has earned the right to do less than their best. You must have a hope that's strategic. Determined has both a sharp and a long range plan. You must pull up with a rope of hope and not dig deep into a hole of fear. A rope of hope, not a shovel of fear. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the indefinite of things not seen. The substance of the protected right to vote. Automatic registration at age 18. The substance of early voting in every state. The substance of a constitutional right to vote as opposed to states' rights. The substance of pay equity for women. Of affordable and desegregated education. Student loan debt, written credit card debt, give it up. Let's make education accessible and affordable for all of America's children. The substance of sensitivity to the predicament of immigrants and Muslims, of reinvestment in our cities, of policies around guns and drugs in and jobs out, a White House conference on violence, causes and cures, racial and gender disparity, the impact of poverty on our lives. Second, we must turn protests into political organizing. Use protests to dramatize and educate. Use politics to register and vote in record numbers and to change unfair and regressive laws. We must organize and fight to have the right to vote amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Fourth, we must keep a positive vision of the kind of country we want before the American people. Fifth, students must keep marching. The trajectory of youth must look into the future. You are not our future. You are our right now. Stand tall right now. Fight xenophobia right now. Fight racism right now. Fight sexism right now. In war right now. It gets difficult sometimes, but walk until the winding road finds an end. Let nothing break your spirit. It gets dark, but surely the morning cometh and the dark must flee. Have a commitment to healing, to building, to heal the breach. If you plant two seeds in the ground of equal strength, and you grow a wall between them, one will be tall and multiples of fruit, one will be short and stunted. The taller is not better, the smaller is not lesser. It's the one that had access to sunshine, something called photosynthesis, grew. When the walls come down, we can all grow together. This land is our land. This nation is our nation. (laughs) 
learn to live with classmates of different ethnic groups and religions. We are an ethnic, the diverse nation, a multicultural nation at our best. We've survived apart, and we must learn to live together. Living together across lines of race and gender and religion, the forward by hope, not backwards by fear, must characterize our marches, our efforts. The Bible puts it most profoundly, it says it's, it's, it's healing time, it's hope time, it's mercy time. And if my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, they'll hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. U of M, keep hope alive. This land is our land. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, I'm Ben Cole Thompson. Uh, let me begin by thanking the leadership of this university, Susan Collins, the Dean of the Ford School, for the foresight for this. Uh, John Grace, the Chairman of Rainbow Push Automotive Board, and of course, um, my friend, uh, Dr. Mark Sloshel, the 14th President of the University of Michigan, uh, for the leadership that the University of Michigan is providing. Uh, there is no other university right now in the nation, I think, that is being forefront with this kind of conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I think this is so significant that we are here historically at the University of Michigan where Kennedy unveiled the Peace Corps and uh, several presidents in the past have appeared before this university to unveil issues around public policy. So we're here again with the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Before we begin, I want to thank my wife who's always uh, my support here. I think I need to fulfill all righteousness, Dana Thompson. I think my wife as well, all politics are local, son of Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> all right, Dana is a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. I have a grandson who's a freshman at U of M, and because he's in the, university, he's in the engineering school, he's too busy to hear his granddad speak. <laughs> he's not playing football, he's designing football fields. <laughs> so, uh, we have um, uh, music and concert coming up to really serenade Reverend Jackson, but before then, uh, there are lots of questions. I've been getting a lot of emails this afternoon from students who actually are interested um, in hearing from you, Reverend, about where we are as a nation. Um, one of the questions says, uh, is the Trump election the white uprising of 2016? How can we change the systemic mechanisms that benefit white people in America? Can it be done? We've been here before. You know, in 1861, the choice was slavery or freedom, you know, uh, Secession, we chose union and freedom. We passed that test. In 1964, the choice was Goldwater arguing the case for statehood segregation and Johnson for a new inclusive America. We won that test. We didn't win the test last Tuesday, but it is not over. I say it's not over because with a two million popular people vote, the people spoke louder than those who opined. We must not give up hope. Every now and then it's clouded, but it does not mean that the sun is not shining beyond the clouds. Don't surrender your spirit. Don't turn on your neighbors. It is wrong to ban Muslims. 
It is. It is wrong to glorify tearing down walls in Germany and building walls between us and Mexico. It is wrong. It's wrong for men to try to control women's bodies and deny women the right to self-determination. It is wrong. It's wrong to tempt somebody's LGBTQ to violate their person. It is wrong. In fact, better we fight the right fight and lose temporarily and fight the wrong fight and win. Let's keep fighting the right fight. So I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what your reaction was on the night of the election, uh, because uh, this was not only a national event, but a global event. The world was watching what was going to happen in the United States. Uh, what was your reaction? I was disappointed. <laughs> but Champions play with pain. You fall down, you get up again. Because the ground is no place for champions. You have to play even with the pain and seek to understand what you're looking at. The fact that there is legitimate economic anxiety and pain at the base. We've globalized capital, but not human rights, not international law, not women's rights, not children's rights. If we are playing a basketball game in China, we can live with the outcome. If we're playing a, uh, a trade game with China, we can't live with the outcome. On the athletic side, why can we accept the outcome? The playing field is even, and the rules are public, and the goals are clear, the referee is fair, and the score is transparent. That's not true on the trade side. So, Fair trade is the answer, not isolation. We must learn fair trade is the answer. We cannot go into isolation. We are one third of our own hemisphere. Two thirds of our neighbors speak Spanish. English is a minority language in this hemisphere. We need bridges, not walls. We are a great nation because we reach out. When we live above international law and human rights, and self-determination and economic justice, we declare, un, we declare preemptive wars and penal price for it. We must live with and in the world, not above it. Arrogance precedes the fall. The United States is the leading superpower. Um, looking at what happened Tuesday night, uh, you get to travel around the world a lot. I'm curious how you think other nations uh, because the U.S. Uh, for a long time has ascribed itself this sort of a moral authority to call out nations that supposedly are violating human rights or may not be, you know, uh, really on the up and up. Uh, even the State Department keeps a list of nations that it claims have human rights violations. Nelson Mandela under Bush was listed as a terrorist, you know, until it was removed. I'm curious now, uh, how do you think other nations like Egypt and others would now view the United States looking at you know, uh, the, the, the political system here today? Much of our moral authority is our own self-described label. I heard uh, someone say the other day that we have been a great democracy for 240 years. That counts since 1776. African, African landed here in, in, in 1619. We were here 157 years before 1776. Didn't we matter as work without wages? We went from no rights to three-fifths of a human being. From that to Jim Crow, from that to segregation. We, are, we, we have before us the challenge of becoming a moral authority. And now we find ourselves growing increasingly arrogant. Uh, there's, there's strength and humility. Uh, not in arrogance, in love, not in hate. Uh, if your neighbor's house is on fire, you say, I'm looking at the ball game, I hear a siren, my neighbor's house is on fire. Well, I know he was a house on kitchen fire because he drinks and smokes and, and sifts pot and all kinds of drugs and he went to sleep 
with cigarette burning and so his house on fire. He has a problem. He does have a problem. But the wind blows and you live next door. So, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. We are each other's keeper. In the world where, if we, could, if we got on a plane in New York, one going to Senegal, one going to uh, LA, we get there about the same time. Science has dwarfed distance and, and, and technology has distance his distance has shortened time. There are no more foreigners in this world. Everybody sees what everybody else is doing in real time. And so learning to live together is a moral challenge. I hope that we're up to that task. And I, I want this universe to remain a moral sanctuary for caring for people. Care for all your classmates. Care for all of your classmates and all your faculty members. We all matter at U of M. Set the pace for the nation. We number one, not just when you play our way, but <laughs> so, I mean, you, you <laughs> be number one when you play Ohio State. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was looking at the, the images across the nation, the protest uh, in New York, in Chicago, across the land. Uh, normally, those images come to us from uh, the television screens around the world when nations do not accept the legitimacy of their governments. They take to the streets to protest to basically um, register legitimate discontent about the president, about the leaders themselves. But for the first time perhaps in recent memory, recent history, we are seeing in the United States massive protests, thousands of people across the nation registering legitimate discontent. What do you make of that? And what does that say about the U.S. I, where I remember we are some today? Mexican children the other day crying for fear that their parents would be deported. There were some young Muslim girls who were upset because the hijab had been snatched from their heads. And if that happens to any one of your classmates, embrace them. You must be your own private sanctuary for your classmate, your friend, your neighbor. We cannot stand either by. To be silent is to betray our conscience. We must not be silent in the face of these violations of human rights. The black America, rights. America, that's why I said, Mechelin, there's, there's a tug of war for the soul of America. Shall it be aristocracy for the few and, and then make a lot of money and pay no taxes? Or shall it be a democracy for the many? Shall it be one person, one vote? Or shall we assume that one corporation is one person, which is so absurd and vulgar? Who are we? We have an identity crisis. We must be that land that we talk about Give me your tired, you poor, you're hungry, your whole mass yearn to breathe free. What makes us great is embrace those who yearn for freedom, who yearn for dignity. At universities like this, there'll be students on this campus who fear being put out of class and deport, deporting after the next semester. We must put, take a strong stand against having our classmates deported. We must be each other's sanctuary. Um. I know you, uh, you just spoke with um, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. I'm curious uh, as to your take. What do you think was, uh, what was it that was underestimated about this election that has proven those perhaps who were thinking optimistically, you know, supporting their other candidate Hillary Clinton wrong? What was, what was it that was underestimated about this election? In, in what sense, Bickley? Democrats were anxious that Basically, they were excited that Hillary Clinton was going to win. So obviously, they underestimated something about the election that uh, pivoted to Trump. There are two issues. One, she did win. <laughs> the popular vote. Mm -hmm. In a democratic society, the popular vote matters. And a suppressed vote matters, and as a consequence, between the popular vote lead and the suppressed vote, that dynamic equals victory. And we would not do well to assume that popular vote does not matter. Anybody that do that will accept uh, in your cities, emergency managers rather than elected officials. E elected officials, you get elected one day, 
and they're gonna give you an emergency manager the next day. That does, that's the kind of electoral college. We demand the right to elect the officials to represent us and let one person, one vote stand. And I would certainly hope that we would not give up on that. I think so long, while there are those who want to make the Second Amendment a priority, I say the First Amendment is first, because the First Amendment is a priority. Use your right to, to demonstrate, but do so nonviolently, with discipline, goals, targets, time. Demonstrations matter when they're clear and focused and nonviolent. President Barack Obama, the nation's first African-American president, has less than two months in office. In your remarks, you said he should offer a preemptive, as you call it, a pardon for Hillary Clinton. Are there other items or lists of things that you would like Obama do before he exits the White House? I think, first of all, in some perspective, when he came in office, we lost 800,000 jobs that month. We've had a net gain of jobs every month since. That matters. The banks were in a global meltdown. They've been revived. Not connected to reinvestment and lending, but revived. Uh, the automotive industry had gone down. Even Americans were laughing at low quality cars out, coming out of uh, Michigan. And that was number one again. 20 million Americans have health insurance that did not have it before. Somebody said, well, the problem with affordable health care is it balloons at the end. If a new car comes off the lot and the brakes are not working, the steering wheel is not working, don't destroy it. You, you recall it and fix it. Don't go backwards from affordable health care. People who don't have jobs and make, need affordable health care more than ever. And so, there are two things you could do. One is, uh, if you were, just look at Detroit for a moment as we think creatively for a moment. If that's a commitment that we have 100,000 vacant homes in abandoned lots in Detroit, and about the same in Chicago, to remove lead paint jobs, to do landscaping and cut the weeds and the bushes down, and use SBA loans to put entrepreneurs in business jobs, to demolish those homes and businesses that cannot be restored jobs, where there are boards put up window panes and put in painting and glazing and roofing, that may be more jobs than people if jobs are a priority. Let put America back to work be a priority. That's what Dr. King's last mission. And so we need a White House conference on violence, causes and cures. All you do is dust off the Chronicle Commission report, violence, causes and cures, we're the most heavily armed nation on earth. Um, we lost about 6,000 soldiers in Iraq in 10 years and 30,000 a year at home. We are the most violent nation on earth. We can't deny it and we certainly should not brag about it. And when the idea of allowing military assault weapons to be sold on, on commonplace, there's no defense against these weapons. Uh, I don't know what the executive order can do, but these, are, these weapons can shoot down planes. Uh, they shoot up churches and theaters. We must ban military assault weapons. You said. And I repeat, I, I, I don't misunderstood about this in the business. Lincoln could have taken a position, given the, the Civil War, where uh, Calhoun and Lee and those guys sought to overthrow our government. They would have been convicted and hung, tried, executed. Lincoln said, for the good of our nation, let's heal the wounds of war and go forward. And he forgave them and, and pardoned them. And there was some consternation because there are those who wanted him to punish them. 800,000 Americans were killed more than any other war since that time. But Lincoln chose healing and not hurting. You said, same, wait, 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 same as came with, with Nixon. There were those who just wanted, wanted just, just a little of Nixon given what Watergate meant. And it would have been uh, a kind of uh, gratification for some. We finally got him. President Ford said, no, we don't need him for truth. We need him to move on, let go on with the nation's business. Uh, and by the way, Nixon was not tried was not convicted, 
uh, and didn't apply for a pardon. Ford made an executive order in the national interest of America. Hillary Clinton has not been tried or convicted, been facing all those hearings, but there are those who want to drag her for the next three years into making a decision with them of defining who we are. It's not fair, it's not necessary. If you unleash a special prosecutor, they have godlike powers, more than even attorney generals cannot stop them. Presidents cannot stop them. They will not stop until they find some reason to put her in jail. What a travesty that would be. How divisive, how unnecessary. I say not only pardon her, but there are several thousand, several thousand other Americans who paid their federal dues for the crime they committed and pardon them too. A kind of emancipation proclamation. Let's start over again. Uh, Reverend. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about letting those in jail out. That's not what I'm discussing. They're, they're paying that to those who've served their time and are out. Right. They see the, the burden of the label of, of ex felon. Many of them can't vote and they can't function. And we reduce their, their, that, we reduce the damage and reduce their person, reduce their productivity. What's the purpose of the judge gives you five years? Why should the society give you 25 more? So, um, There is another issue that I want to bring up because you talked about putting America back to work, uh, the Flint water crisis. Uh, what happens to Flint now? Flint needs water bottles, not water pipes, not water bottles. The people of Flint stand out. There, there are nine other places in Michigan with water as poisonous as it were in Flint. It just stay, says that I, I, I'm inclined to believe that there have been uh, a lot of publicity around Flint. Uh, if there were a commitment to, in, in the, if that's the infrastructure project, you put steel workers back to work and pipe for those construction people back to work, save lives in the environment. In the environment. We have no idea the impact of water with heavy lead on, on the lives of children the rest of their lives. Flint is a national disgrace and should be a national priority. This governor has a $600 million rainy day fund. Not a dime has gone to Flint. It, Flint is raining in Flint, raining down poison. The federal government calls Flint a, uh, an emergency and not as a disaster. So the federal government offers five million rather than 95 million. Flint is a disaster zone and needs recovery now. Flint deserves recovery. Now. Uh, towards the end of the Bush, um, we, we saw the auto industry crisis towards the end of the Bush administration. Obama, President Obama came in and rescued the industry. Now we're seeing the Flint water crisis. What do you expect or should we expect uh, what should be done as it relates to the administration of Donald Trump? Well, he has said that a priority for him and it may become a run issue is to invest in infrastructure. It certainly is a way between putting America back to work. We have several trillion dollars in offshore taxes that have not been paid. He understands how that works. <laughs> and uh, there should be a system arranged, a deference made to bring that money back to America, targeted for reinvestment. These inner cities need more than a uh, bank, Dr. Cecil. They need development banks. When we say Marshall Plan, we're not talking about the amount of money in Marshall Plan. It may have been 13 billion. What made the Marshall Plan significant was in a zone that was 50 years long term low interest loans in these inner cities that have been devastated by bank exploitation uh, and government lack of investment uh, and by various forms of of, of escape. We need not only to, to redevelop them, but a banking system for those zones for reconstruction. We know how to reconstruct nations, and we should apply it at home. You, you talk about Detroit and reconstruction a lot, and I, I spoke to the mayor's administration this week for a column tomorrow about how the city of Detroit responds to the Trump administration. Um, how do you think, or what should urban cities do Chicago, Detroit, Washington, you name it, across the nation. Uh, how should they relate to the new administration in Washington? We need 
economic reconstruction, but we, but we cannot trade off how we treat our neighbor. I want a job, but the price you pay for it cannot be to violate people's human rights. We can do both. You, you can rebuild schools without having children in school crying, fearing deportation. You can rebuild cities without having, uh, without banning Muslims. You can rebuild cities without, without xenophobic language and behavior. So that the, the issue is not shall we reconstruct uh, the cities, shall we reconstruct relationships. Two we share 2,000 miles of border with Mexico, 2,000 miles. We do more trade with Mexico on a given day than we do with China and Japan. Do you want to make your next door neighbor an enemy? It's irrational. Mexico is the, is the gateway to South Central and Latin America. That's why I said, as we think globally, not just locally, and see the world through a door, not through a kill, we are 6% of the world's population. And Putin and his, Mr. Trump's group, represent 6%. Most, that one eighth of the human race is African, one fourth Nigerian. Two thirds of our neighbors are Latin Americans. Most people in the world today are yellow, brown, black, non-Christian, poor, female, young, and don't speak English. In that world, we must lead the world in coexistence and not threaten co-annihilation. In that world, we must live together. I, I want to run some names by you. Uh, these are these are being talked about as potential picks, cabinet secretaries for the new administration. Don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Rudy Giuliani, the former mayor of New York, has been uh, mentioned as a potential, uh, the number one diplomat for the United Nations, for the United, United States. Um, Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions is also, his name is in the, in the ring as a potential attorney general. What is your take so far about these names that have been put out here? Make America great again. <laughs> I mean, they, re they represent their party. It seems to me that, that some people got to make some decisions, like I really voted for him, but I'm willing to excuse all of this stuff to get to him because I might get a job. You should not risk filing your neighbor even for a job. We, we need jobs. We also need decency and dignity and a sense of humanity as well. And I, I'm concerned that as we look at these, some of these names are being surfaced, that um, they may do our nation harm. But that, that, that if, we, if we concede this election and don't fight for the suppressed vote, uh, and, and December 19th, which is the day the electors elect, we'll have to live with that for a season. It will not be a pretty picture because the world is not standing by waiting for us to violate them. We, we, isolation is not the way of the world. Globalization is the will of the world, but it must be balanced globalization. It's interesting that our, our telecom and our uh, fast media has a balanced system, but our economics do not. And so we must balance our, our global economics. Also, most people don't realize we are not a part of the, of the, of the world uh, court. So we, we, only, only poor nations, when they violate, are poor before the world court. But we should, we, should, we should not live above the world court. We should all commit ourselves to justice. When your school plays Ohio State in a few days from now, on the real side, you want to win the game. You really geek to win the game. And if it's 10 yards for every first down, and six point four touchdowns, you can accept the outcome. If one school has to run 12 yards for a first down, one has to run eight yards, you can't accept the outcome. It is just, just out of justice. Peace comes out of justice. A sense of fairness. Uh, and you cannot favor the team that's wearing the gray and red or the team that's wearing blue and gold. There must be a sense of fairness. We seem to have given up on justice as a reasonable standard. Justice is reasonable. Uh, it, it is often said, Reverend, that, you know, a, a true functioning democracy has to have a vibrant press. Uh, we've seen uh, a pattern now since Donald Trump's election, uh, picking up a fight with the media this morning. He was on Twitter with the New York Times, 
Any concerns about uh, the role of the media here in moving forward, especially after this election, lessons learned? Well, one lesson learned is that the media cannot, the media did a lot to promote Trump uh, and was not as, did not critique as well as it should have critiqued. But we need a free and vibrant media. And we cannot, and uh, social media opinions are not the same as well-trained journalists who think you in the research. Mm. I mean, the social media opinions cannot compare with the well-thought-out story. We must not give up on that narrative. I have two more questions. Um, we've seen before this election uh, the new wave. We talked about this, uh, University of Missouri, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and so forth. Uh, but going back to the civil rights movement, it's well documented that you know, the movements for social change actually started on student campuses. Uh, for some, this moment represents perhaps a new era, a new civil rights movement, or perhaps reigniting the past. What role do you see students playing on university campuses across this nation at this point in time? Being a source of conscience, use their freedom to mature into a sense of social justice. Uh, I remember 19 years old going to jail with seven classmates trying to use the public library. I came into my sense of maturity within the country, losing my fear of jails and death by going to a jail. And then other jailings fighting to open the doors. The good news is what keeps my hope alive is that we have these dark moments, but we're winning. When I look at the Carolina Panthers for the Atlanta Falcons, they couldn't have been behind the cotton curtain. It would have been illegal. You couldn't have had the Olympics behind the cotton curtain in Atlanta, Georgia. You couldn't have had CNN in Georgia. You couldn't have had South Carolina as the number one producer of tires behind the cotton curtain. You couldn't have had the great Clemson, Alabama game behind the cotton. We, we are more civil, but it's just like swimming from Britain to France. It's not the distance that the tackles from, it's the undercurrent. And there is in life, uh, on the currents. There are crosswinds, there's the unanticipated. And sometimes these winds knock you down. You cannot look for the first blade of grass to allow. You got to get back up and keep fighting. I repeat again, deep water does not drown you. You drown when you stop kicking. Paul said there was a shipwreck one time and people were inclined to panic. He said, well, some uh, made it on boards and some on broken pieces. A few days ago, John Graves, I was walking down the street and I saw, well, I really didn't see it because I slipped and fell, uh, broken sidewalks. And a root had grown under one of the trees and lifted the sidewalk and it was kind of lifted. And I, I looked back to where I had fallen and in that crack, there was some grass coming out. Just a little daylight, a little sunshine, a little water. Life sometimes comes to the cracks. Sometimes it does not come in whole pieces. You must find life where it is and let life express itself. Even semen cannot suppress it ultimately. We the people, in, in, the, end, in the end, right will prevail. Uh, suffering breeds character, and character breeds faith, and the end, faith will prevail. It is about on that belief that we go forward and don't surrender. Uh, that's a nice segue, Reverend, to my final question. Next week is Thanksgiving. Um, there are lots of families who will be having Thanksgiving, but in fear, in a state of fear, unsure what will happen the next day, the next week, in January. What do you say to those families uh, that, you know, might have a different Thanksgiving this year because of the climate in the nation today? Well, if I were a Turk, I would not organize a Thanksgiving dinner. That's the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you got that point? The <laughs> Turk should not organize Thanksgiving dinners. Got the point, Bengali? Yes, I do. Uh, I get <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we cannot settle for people having a meal, a day, a year. People need to have the capacity to have a balanced meal every day. That's the first issue. The second issue, some of the great heroes and heroes of our time are people who in World War II 
who found threatened Jews and gave them sanctuary. Their lives were defined by providing for frightened people sanctuary. A little love will do. If there is some student, some classmate of yours who you know is anxious and maybe cry at night because the fear of deportation, maybe you ought to take them home for Thanksgiving with you and be kind. And not only should your school be a sanctuary and not and, and fight for policies that protect, I mean, you, you have students in this university right now who have come against greater odds and they're doing well in class, but they fear being deported. We can mobilize and fight for policies that stop that from happening. I think if we mobilize, the worst may not happen. It is it's silence that's betrayal. Uh, when we didn't have the right to vote, we got the right to vote because we marched with discipline. And all I'm saying to you is that fight for the protected right to vote. What makes America right, great is the right to fight for the right. Fight for affordable health care. Fight for student loan debt reduction. Uh, fight to, to, to forgive student loans. Fight for that which is meaningful. You fight for Supreme Court justice. The moral is supreme, not the supreme in their power. And keep fighting. And there are checks and balances. Uh, you know, Trump will not be to move on America like he moved on, on a hotel. There, there are checks and balances. Uh, because I interest, one reason why he is not going to move the way on affordable care he thought he was because many of his constituents need affordable care. There are people who were so confused until they wanted affordable care, but they didn't want Obamacare. <laughs> they wanted omelet, but didn't want eggs. <laughs> but now they will find out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Reverend. <laughs> My name is Aaron Dworkin. I serve as Dean of the School of Music, Theater, and Dance here at the University of Michigan. First, I would just like to share our appreciation again to Reverend Jackson for joining us as we celebrate your legacy and commitment to civil rights for more than 50 years. Thank you again so much. As we get set up here, uh, I just wanted to share, when Dean Collins shared with me her desire that the performing arts and its role in the civil rights movement serve as an important part of this symposium, I was moved and filled with excitement for the opportunity that our students would have to demonstrate some of the ways in which the arts can help us shape a better society. The reality is that the arts have played a pivotal role in social justice movements from the very beginning. Frederick Douglass, the great orator, statesman, freedom fighter, leading the abolitionist movement, played the violin, as well as his son and his grandson, Joseph Douglass, was the first black violinist to tour nationally and internationally. Frederick Douglass believed all fully emancipated, civilized men should understand music. To that end, he taught himself to play the violin, which served an important role in his life, and which is why you will find his violin atop his desk at the Frederick Douglass Museum in DC. Martin Luther King Jr. and many others in the civil rights movement grew up with a piano and the performing arts in their homes. Martin and Coretta met at a music school where she was studying voice and violin. Dr. King shared at a speech he gave in 1964 in Berlin, Long before the modern essayists and scholars wrote of racial identity as a problem for a multiracial world, musicians were returning to their roots to affirm that which was stirring within their souls. Much of the power of our freedom movement in the United States has come from this music. It has strengthened us with its sweet rhythms when courage began to fail. It has calmed us with its rich harmonies when spirits were down. For in the particular struggle of the Negro in America, there is something akin to the universal struggle of modern man. For over 50 years, Reverend Jackson has been at the forefront of these issues. 
of the great Mahalia Jackson, you stated, that's where the power comes from. When there is no gap between what you say and who you are, what you say and what you believe, when you can express that in song, it is all the more powerful. It is now my honor to welcome to the stage a number of our talented SMTD students and faculty who will depict the values and ignite the emotions of the civil rights movement through song, dance, drama, and instrumental music. Each artist and performance will be individually introduced by Justin Gordon, who is an LSNA student minoring in global theater and ethnic studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Gordon to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, I am humbled and grateful to be here. And I'd like to speak on behalf of all of my family in the room, personally to Reverend Jackson and say that after your remarks today and your presence here on campus, our respect and reverence for you and your legacy has deepened even more. And, and I just want to give a humble thank you to begin this, this serenade of music and performance for you. And he, his message has inspired us to be able to say all around the world together, we all gonna say it together. I am. Somebody. somebody. I said, I am, I am. Somebody. somebody. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. I appreciate you. I'd like to first introduce Mr. Jordan Samuels. He is a musical theater student and a baritone vocalist, and his accompaniment would be from Professor Jason DeBoer. He will be singing the song Make Them Hear You from the musical Ragtime. The original singer and performer of this song is Brian Stokes Mitchell, and in the musical, uh, it was, the song was sung by the protagonist named Cole House Walker Jr. And he was a successful black pianist who started a riot and revolt after his wife was shot down by murderous policemen only after trying to shake the hand of then President Theodore Roosevelt. Ladies and gentlemen, please, Mr. Samuels. Make them hear you, make them hear you. Your sword can be a sermon or the power of the pen. Teach every child to raise his voice and then my brothers then. Will justice be demanded by 10 million righteous men? Make them hear you. When they hear you, I'll be near you again.
time for Mr. Jordan Samuels, please. Now, now, some people sing songs. That man just sang that song right there. Next, I'd like to present to you an excerpt from the documentary Love, Life, and Loss, which featured the song Seven Last Words of the Unarmed, uh, originally composed by Joel Thompson and will be performed by the University of Michigan Men's Glee Club. Under the direction of Mr. Eugene Rogers, Associate Chair of Choirs and the Professor of Conducting here at R.S.T. University. Please, enjoy. should do more than entertain. Great art should connect you to things that are going on today. I wanted to process my own feelings about being a young black man in this very racially tense time and also to, to do something about it. I remember making a very purposeful decision like, I need to say something with this art. I need to provide healing with this art. So the Seven Last Words is a multi-movement work that features the last words of African-American men who've lost their lives before their time. Music is a good outlet to really tell a story. And I think that's what we're doing here with these pieces. We're really telling a story and to have the perspective of the people that were lost. The Michigan Men's Glee Club is one of the oldest choral organizations in the United States. The Seven Last Words is a good fit for the Glee Club because of how diverse the choir is. Having people of various races singing the words of this struggle is very meaningful to me and very moving to me to see people connecting with the pain. This piece purposefully is very shocking and it is meant to inspire our, our reaction. I don't think great art should always make us feel comfortable. It's easy to get wrapped up in anger, but I feel a lot more needs to be focused on honoring their lives. Now more than ever do we need art to create sincere dialogue between disparate groups. That's the point of really truly great art, is we're trying to inspire that conversation. It's not about a color of your skin, it's not about the type of person you are, it's really about, it's really about life. It doesn't matter what the nature of the loss is because it is tragic no matter who it happens to. As we focus on love, life, and loss, regardless of one's political opinion, we can all agree on the value of human life. Thank you. 
I'd like to now, with my personal pledges, bring to the stage a super soprano vocalist, Miss Kayla Hill. She'll be accompanied today by Mr. Joshua Marzan, and she'll be singing a song called Mistral Man by Margaret Bond, which is one song in a set of three called The Three Dream Portraits. These set of songs were accompanied with text from poems of the late, the great, Langston Hughes. This song in particular uh, personifies a mindset of a minstrel performer while always having to continuously have a joyous exterior while struggling and wrestling with inner turmoil that structural racism always brings. Please welcome Ms. Kayla Hill to the stage. Anyone else just absolutely floored by that performance? Man, oh my, I, 
I'm from the west side of Detroit, Michigan, and we don't get a lot of opera singing. The first time I ever heard anyone personally sing opera was three weeks ago during the practice. And my, my whole perception during singing has changed ever since I heard Miss Hill's voice. One more time for Miss Hill. <clears throat> this next uh, program and the leader of this program deals with a certain demographic that we forget about. A certain demographic that sometimes does not get the resources that they were entitled to as citizens and they were taken away uh, technically by the 13th Amendment. Uh, I'm speaking uh, uh, to the Institute of Prisons and the Prison Industrial Complex and the Prison Creative Arts Project who was fighting against those inhumane practices that are happening behind those walls but to our brothers and sisters. Uh, the Prison Creative Arts Project, which we will see here uh, in a film presentation and subsequent after the the film presentation, the director herself will come and give a scene of her play doing time behind the visiting glass. I'll allow you to learn and see what fighting for lives really looks like when you can't physically touch someone. Thank you. My students and I are here for a theater exchange program with Unihio, which is the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro. We are a program at the University of Michigan called the Prison Creative Arts Project, or PCAP, and we do theater work in prisons with adults and children throughout the state of Michigan. Here in Rio, we have collaborators who do incredible theater for social change work in hospitals, prisons, and favelas. O teatro é um espaço que, sendo um espaço seguro, em que questões particulares daquelas comunidades podem surgir, em que eles podem colocar as suas próprias opiniões, que eles podem criar a partir da sua realidade, recriar a sua realidade. Então, na verdade, eu acho que o coração né, desse, desse trabalho está em abrir espaços para que a voz dessas pessoas seja ouvida ou seja né, é, proferida. In Brazil, Theater is of the people, for the people. This is a very Latin American tradition. It doesn't just belong to Brazil. But when my students come here, they realize that theater can happen in many different ways that they had not previously imagined, and that theater has many different practical roles in people's lives. Really high quality professional theater can happen in a cramped waiting room of the hospital where the actors have this much room to do a whole play and it can be marvelous. <coughs> Nunca se compare com mais ninguém. Nunca antes houve uma pessoa como você e nunca haverá. Você é absolutamente única no passado, no presente, no futuro, no pretérito, no futuro mais perfeito. Eu não sei mais nenhuma conjugação. My brother's an artist. He draws and paints, but mostly he does graffiti. Right now, he's doing seven years for graffiti. Imaginate seven years of your life for a crime where nobody got hurt? Who's it helping for him to be in prison? The guy whose wall he wrote on? Shoot, would have helped that guy more if they gave him community service and made him clean up the pinche wall. I think mostly they locked him up because he's a smart ass. So uh, when we was kids, we took this trip to El Paso and we saw this mural that said, God is Mexican. <laughs> and Danny, my brother, loved that. When we got back to Phoenix, he started going everywhere, writing it on all the walls. God is a Chicana. Dios es un mojado. God comes from the barrio. God hangs out at Tito's. <laughs> he didn't just paint the words, he made them beautiful. We grew up having this real strange relationship with God because of my mother. So 
we were Catholic and we went to church on Sundays and prayed like everybody else. But during the rest of the week, Ama would talk to God like he was her compadre or something. Like he was right there washing the dishes and folding the laundry. And then she'd get mad at God and call him stupid and yell at him. And then she'd have to apologize because he's God, right? So she'd say something like, Perdóname, Diosito, pero I was angry with you this morning for sending rain on the day of Lolita's first communion. But then I realized the Jew sent the bad weather on purpose so that it would blow Doña Violeta's ugly dress over her head on the steps of the church to punish her for being una vieja chismosa. <laughs> now that your plan has been revealed to me, I want to say how sorry I am for gelling at you this morning and for eating that extra communion wafer durante la misa porque tenía hambre. Pero ya no quiero hablar más de eso. <laughs> so this was my mother, right? We heard this all day long. And then my brother, well, he'd been hanging out with all these guys, right? And one night, a bunch of those guys got arrested. And if Danny had been with them, he would have got picked up too. So, uh, so we started going to all of those places where he used to write, God is an undocumented immigrant, and God dances cumbias. And he started writing his friends' names instead. Aldo Gutierrez is in prison. Israel Cienfuegos is in prison. Freddy Ramirez is in prison. The day the cops caught him, he was writing, Leo Archuleta is in prison. God is with him. God is a prisoner. He tried to run when he saw the cops, but they caught him, and three of them beat him until he had a concussion, and they broke his right hand so that he don't write so good no more. And after that, Amma stopped talking to God for a week, and, uh, and now Danny, he writes us letters in this, this real shaky handwriting. And at the bottom, underneath his signature, he always writes, God is a prisoner. I am honored to say that Dr. Ashley Lucas is my mentor and arguably the greatest human being I personally know. And if you don't know who she is, uh, as the late great contemporary poet Christopher Wallace, AKA Biggie Small said, if you don't know, now you know, students. <laughs> Next, I'd like to present an excerpt from a, a moving dance piece called City of Rain created by Camille A. Brown and performed by U of M dance majors and Masters of Fine Arts candidates. This film, Moving Dance Piece, represents the spirit of perseverance in the face of struggle, loss, and grief. Please, enjoy. Thank you. 
if I could dance like that, I wouldn't be up here talking to you all right now. I, I just moved for a living. That was, that was amazing. That was amazing. Now, we're almost at our conclusion, and we have had some triumph. We have had some encouraging words. We got to end with some jazz, right? We got to end with some music, correct? Yes, yes. I'm proud to present a jazz quartet for the ages. We got Kassan Belgrave on saxophone, Every Reed on drums, Brian Jarez on bass, and uh, David Lazar on trumpet. They will be playing Well, a song by Bud Powell. He was a great jazz pianist back in the 40s and 50s that battled police brutality and racism despite making classic music. Afterwards, they'll play a song called Cyclic Episode. Now, as all good parties go and all good celebrations go, we got to give you something to leave with, something to go home with. We got to send Reverend Jackson Jackson home on a good note, on a great note, even as he walks outside of the door, correct? All right. We have one of our esteemed professors and musicians, Tiffany Ng, will be playing on the carillon out in the bell tower. She will be playing Negro spirituals as we leave, as you walk to your cars or buses, songs such as Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. L ladies and gentlemen, that is my time. I love you all, family. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.